listening to part three of our three-part symposia with Alan Abba Dessa Green. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. I'm Gemini, your host for our symposium with Alan Abba Dessa Green. Susan, Sabelle, and Chipper will be joining our conversation. Alan is an author, researcher, and editor of Sync Book One, Myths, Magic, Media, and Mindscapes, and Sync Book Two, Outer and Inner Space, Shadow and Light. Both books explore synchronicity and synchromysticism through the writings of authors within the sync community. This community is defined as a community committed to exploring the impossible. Alan is well versed in contemporary myths, memes, and synchronicities, revealing amazing insight into ourselves, our culture, and our world. Syncbook Radio features two weekly podcasts, 42 minutes, and always record with an archive of conversations and interviews with some of the most intriguing minds. Additionally, Alan is the author of a blog titled, Look at All the Happy Creatures, in his soon-to-be-released book, Suicide Kings. We are speaking with Alan Abadessa Green. Alan, we're going to move on to the topic of synchromysticism. Okay, sure. Hey, Alan, this is Sabelle again. Would you describe synchromysticism as a spiritual path or a spiritual practice like Tai Chi or meditation? I would, but I have to put the caveat that... It's only part of the answer. So uh, the, the phrase, or the, I guess you'd call it, the term synchromysticism was coined by Jake Katza. And he basically, he, he had a, a definition of it was just the observing of either you know, synchronous events or mystical events or occult events in pop culture. And he actually meant this phrase to define something with pop culture because uh, he you know, again, this idea of dissecting media and seeing what you can pick apart in it. Now, I think that that definition, even though, of course, he's the man who, who coined it, the the word's gotten bigger than Jake. Uh, I, lo- I love Jake. I don't mean it like that. I just mean his original definition. I think at this point, people use it as this very all-encompassing phrase, and there's disagreements as to what it means. So some people see it as very much a spiritual path. I have seen people who, uh, online, who said, someone wrote, what's synchromysticism? And someone else responded, oh, it's some weird new religion thing. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, (laughs) I I sure don't see it that way. I'm I'm not in the business of going out promoting some newfangled religion. So I'm, I'm always actually always very, very cautious about that. Even when we say this idea of it's a spiritual practice, well, we got to be careful there because we don't want to slip into dogma. So it's just, again, just something I'm always really, really cautious about. But I think the full answer is that some people see it as a, an academic exploration, right? This is something that we can study like a science. There's a science to synchronicity, and if we study it academically, we can, we can break it apart. We have, uh, in the Sync Book 2, Anthony Peake, we have Dr. Kirby Surprise, another gentleman named Robert Perry. These are guys who all, of course, are open to uh, a more spiritual or psycho-spiritual realm or different phenomenon than your than your mainstream scientists. But nonetheless, these are guys taking it from an academic approach. Then you have someone who's going to take it. Uh, your Jake Katze, by the way, I mean, he's someone who I think would very much see it as a spiritual development. At this point, he is someone who has taken on very much the mystic role, and he's doing all this stuff, and he sees it as part of his spiritual development. Then you have someone else, as I was saying, who might see it as an art form. Uh, my, my friend Doug Douglas Bowles, who wrote Winter's Labyrinth and who, who co-hosts 42 Minutes, he's always so nervous about this becoming a religious movement, uh, even more so than myself. And he's like, no, no, we just have to focus on the art. That's, he sees that as the ultimate redeeming quality of this, is we're learning how to analyze art. We're learning how to make art by seeing how things connect and seeing how the, there are sort of like that Joseph Campbell-type monomyth. You know, this, uh, if we're able to see the same story in everything, how does this better inform our artwork? Uh, Bill Klaus, I would probably uh, also lump in there as someone who sees it in this way. And it's this idea of it should be used to develop artwork. Now, I take the position, let's say we have spirituality, we have scientific uh, exploration, and we have artwork. I think my ultimate answer would be, why not all three? If we can find a way to balance those three things, you know, sort of 
head and heart and bring all these things together and understand how each of these things are completely appropriate and completely applied to what we're studying, that's, that's how I would define synchromysticism. Yeah, because I can see people using synchronicity as their personal dialogue with the universe. Oh, yeah. Oh, at least, you know, in, in my life, that's kind of how it works is, is my personal dialogue. You know, why did a rainbow show up right when I was thinking about that, you know, or whatever? And I think any practice, you know, whether it's Tai Chi or art or golf or whatever, developing any kind of practice is also a way to interact with the universe. And it's a way to integrate what you've learned. Yeah, I mean... This idea of practice, I love that you equated the, you know, the artist or the synchromistic with someone who's practicing Tai Chi. It doesn't just have to be, because it doesn't just have to be a spiritual uh, practice, but it can be, it's a, you know, it's, it's a sort of loaded word, but this idea of ritual, not like some grand occult ritual to bring down the Twin Towers. We're not, we're not doing that kind of ritual. We're talking about a practice that you use to develop yourself in something that you literally practice every day or as often as you can or sometimes at every moment of every day to see how do I better integrate these concepts into my life. And I think synchronicity is definitely there as a... These are signs, right? These are sort of like weird signposts in our day whenever we're paying attention to them, or sometimes we stop paying attention. I'm a guy who, and I've spoken to other people who study this, I'm a guy who sometimes it's like so much. You go, oh, I just, I don't want any more synchronicities. I just want to be able to, you know, go through my day like a normal person. I just got to get to the supermarket, get home. I don't want to see any more rainbows or any more 77s or any more any of this stuff, right? It can only take so many epiphanies, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, all right, I just want to turn it off. There are moments where it's something where you, uh, sometimes you're prepared for it and sometimes you're not prepared for it. You stop paying attention. You say, all right, I just want to see if I can turn that part of my brain off and just, I just got to get to the supermarket and get home. I got to be the bank by three o'clock, you know, whatever it is. And these things will slam you. These things will, uh, you know, catch you. I think what I've, I've developed is something where I'm at a place where if I have stuff I need to do, if I'm in that left brain stage where I need to get the bills paid. I need to make it home for this time. Or I need to make it to the bank or whatever I need to do. The synchronicities will still be there. And I could just kind of like smile and nod. And it's almost like if this is, and I, I guess, again, I don't want to speak for, for everybody, but if this is like a personal connection with the universe, I, I love that you said a personal conversation, right? It's an ongoing conversation with the universe. Now, someone might take that to be God or some people might not like that phrasing, but whatever. I know what you're talking about, and if someone wants to get worried about that phrasing, screw them. Um, <laughs> ultimately, it's like I can't worry about it anymore. But uh, <laughs> if this is an ongoing conversation with the universe, God, whatever word suits you best, and these synchronicities are following you even while you're doing your practical things, it's sort of like a very nice reminder that you're... I don't know, your friend or your companion, whatever, whatever word you, you like, is sort of there with you. So it doesn't have to bombard you and be overwhelming. Oh, what does it all mean? It just means you're not alone and these things will be there and you can contemplate them after you take care of what you need to take care of. But to me, I sort of see it as this really nice, and I, I don't know how to separate this from something spiritual, uh, a nice reminder that you're not alone. You're never alone. So how has... This exploring this path of synchronism and synchromysticism impacted you. I mean, who were you before you started on this, and who are you now? Wow. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, I mean, I can say, I think the, the sort of the most specific thing was it really helped me process a lot of the conspiracy research. And there's a, there's a reason that I kind of fixed it on that. It's not like that. Um, how I probably would have self-identified or that I'm trying to distance myself from it. But I think when you do, the, when you're really delving into that conspiracy stuff and everything's dark and everything is become so overwhelming, it, re- it, really, it really affects your mood. Uh, it really affects your personality. I found myself really angry all the time. I mean, it was like, you know, it was one injustice after another. And it's, I mean, there's 
there's a time and a place for that. It's it's uh, it's healthy to be upset. You know, if you see a, a child, you know, murdered by a, a drone, you should be pretty pretty damn upset. I don't ever want to reach a state of quote unquote enlightenment where seeing a child killed by a bomb doesn't upset me. If I ever reach that, I think I have a bigger worry than than anything. I mean, I, I just I would never want to reach a state of some phony enlightenment or or disattachment to that extent. I think we should always be concerned and every now and then really pissed off if that's what the moment calls for. Well, just you know, that, that you were in New York when when the towers fell. I mean, just processing that. I mean, you're in a city that was in shock. Oh, oh, no doubt, no doubt. So, I mean, nine eleven. People talk about mind control, right? I didn't, I didn't get to say this before. Just something really funny. We were saying like all oh, the the seventy sevens and the Wizard of Oz and the Alice in Wonderland, all this sort of stuff. I was saying the personal synchronicities remind me that it's not all that because I was living on seventy seventh Street, across from a building that was called Alice Court. And I lived there for four years before I noticed that that apartment building even had a name. It's like written, it's etched on the stone in a really like old faded stone that I hadn't even seen it for, for a number of years. But now we could talk about this idea of like the conspiracy guys want to break everything down to like some really elaborate. Well, what, what's the, um, oh, I can't think, it was like a, a Rube Goldfarb machine. Is that the expression, right? Where it's like Rube the Goldberg. really Goldberg. Is it Rube Goldberg? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I feel like a lot of the the conspiracy mind control arguments are sort of like that, where it's like, oh, you're going to watch a music video and she's going to cover her eye and it's going to make you think about the Illuminati and then there's like a rainbow which reminds you of something else and then it's like, which I'm not really trying to just make fun of. I'm just saying it's like this sort of overcomplicated idea of this is going to subtly influence you and this and that. Listen, you want to know what mind control is? It doesn't need to be that tricky. It's very obvious. When you see people getting on TV and saying, we have to go invade Iraq, you know, even though it, that's not who attacked us, we need to do it because... And they just keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it and shouting that if you don't do it, you're somehow a bad person and all this sort of stuff. That's mind control and it works. All right? How many people bought into it? How many people bought into that mindset? And I have to admit that I also did. In that moment where I was in New York, so the the towers came down. I had um, friends who worked there. I could smell all the, like, burning, sooty smell uh, for a long time. And I would have dreams of burning buildings, of just, like, I would have dreams of, like, burning skylines. You know, this is a trauma trauma-based mind control. That's exactly what it is. And in this weird sort of dissociative state, I was the most anti-war person. I was, you know, all these things. But in that moment, there was this weird, like, the brainwashing got to me of like, yeah, okay, well, you know, someone's got to pay for this. Something, something's got to be done. And I would find myself saying things that I didn't, it's like, I don't even agree with these things, but I'm, but I'm saying them. And it's that, it's that state of shock when someone's able to do that to you. And so that's, that's basically how mind control works. And you, you, could, you could see that. And that's something that I have, I'll have to sort of deal with. And I'll always try and be kind of making up for and always on, on I don't know, always on alert of uh, knowing that someone was able to make me say something that I don't even believe this is why I, uh, I say I'm not just trying to make fun of conspiracy theories. Uh, I, I hope I've made that clear because I know it is true. What I'm saying is it doesn't, it's somehow, it's simpler than that. It's, you know, it's less carrot and more stick. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we, I'm not saying that there aren't carrots out there. I mean, you know, we have uh, marketing companies which are doing tremendous tremendous efforts to to influence us in subtle ways all the time but you know you also see that they'll try all these subtle things but ultimately if they really want to sell something to you they're going to put a girl in a bikini or something like that they're going to go to the really base instincts of 
hey, we either have to appeal to your fight or flight or your sexual urges. You know, we have to tell you that there's terrorists or you can have sex with somebody. It's basically what it comes down to. All those other things, eh, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. But if they really want to sell you on something, they're going to shout about it and, and put some breasts in your face. And that's probably how you'll get it. Uh, how, that's how you'll sell something. But so to say, like, my, my personal development is I came out of that and I, I noticed this, this change in myself. And when I sort of snapped out of it after about, like, two years, I was just like... You, you could, sort of couldn't deny it anymore, and I, I snapped out of it, and I got really interested in the conspiracy stuff, and like ultimately, how did someone do that to me? How did someone do that to me, and how did they convince everyone to go along with a lie, such an obvious lie? And what would be the point of doing this, and who really pulled off 9-11, and just went into this, these really dark rabbit holes, which of course, I... It's like not like I stopped believing that 9-11 was an inside job. It's not like I stopped believing there's manipulation. But what I'm saying is the conspiracy starts to get, I think everyone's, I don't want to say everyone's experienced this, but I think many people have experienced this, is that the conspiracy gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And what you notice is, well, what about this? I, you know, okay, so obviously the government's controlled, but what about movies? Oh my God, I didn't know there's these things such as Masons and look, there's symbolisms in this movie. And oh my God, I can't even watch that TV show anymore. And now this and now this. And you start, I, I use the example a lot. I say it's a psychedelic experience. That can be literal, but it can also be a metaphor in the sense that what is it if you're all your everything you know your whole life is turned upside down and there's a question mark put on everything that is you know that's an ego death that's something yeah. where you know if you everything you ever thought you knew is wrong right every every uh, every you know even alex jones is going to say you're living a lie you're you're a sheep wake up wake up wake up well what does that mean that means that you know now you're you've turned on some new awareness but now the problem is we start to view everything through that one lens so now we realized, oh, I was fooled. I never want to be fooled again. So it's a total shutdown. You know, we talked about opening these filters or dropping filters. When you realize you've been fooled, you feel dumb. I mean, I know I did. I felt like, oh, my God, how could I be so fucking stupid? How could I fall for this? And you just, I felt terrible myself. And I'm never going to do that again. And you put these walls around yourself and you, you build up more defenses and you just don't trust anybody and you just want, you know, it's what makes you angry and upset. This is why Alex Jones is on TV screaming. This is why the, the you know, the kids who follow him are, are shouting on YouTube comments and, and message boards. They're so upset because they feel like they were duped and they're never going to let anyone do that to them again. Someone wrote here, Gemini wrote, stages of grieving. Absolutely. I mean, this is a grieving process. You're, you're mourning for the life that you knew just as much as you're mourning your pride that you lost by realizing you, you know, were fools. So we go through all these, these stages and we, we just get really, really upset and it just it so weighs heavy on the soul. And I think ultimately what this idea of synchronicity, when I say it's not that I stopped thinking there is manipulation or that there are conspiracies, but... A grieving process essentially ends with acceptance, right? So mm -hmm. you yes. accept that, okay, this world is messed up, <laughs> right? That doesn't mean you should become passive or, or stop caring. It just means you accept, okay, and now what? Now that I know, I'm not going to let my reactions, you know, my emotions run the show. I'm not going to say... I'm not going to get angry over something. I mean, I, I had screaming matches with my friends and my family. You're in, you're in that conspiracy space. Why, do, why don't you see this? Why don't you care? You know? And you, you try and you want to shake someone out of what you went through. And then ultimately, you realize you either can't do that. To, to a certain extent, you can't do that. And to another extent, you're almost like, I had to go through this grief why the hell, it's almost like a selfish thing. Why the hell aren't you going through this grief? If I have to deal with how messed up the world is, how come you can keep going on, you know, yeah, you get to go to the movies and have a good time and go out to the bar and I'm sitting here worried about the dollar collapsing and they're going to, you know, do this. And it's like, if I got to sit home on Saturday night worried about 
researching, you know, 200 year old history. Why the hell you get to go out to the bar and have a good time? There's a certain element of all these things. Yeah. Um, but, you know, ultimately we have to work on ourselves. Uh, and, and I don't mean that as we should be passive with, with world events or, or with our uh, activism. I just mean we try and wake other people up. And the same way we asked before, and I said, we don't know what uh, machine consciousness is. And the gentleman said, we don't know what human consciousness is. How the hell are you going to wake your friend up when you haven't figured out what you're even waking up to yet? So that's when I say you have to work on yourself. And what this, when I say synchronicity helped me through that transitional phase or through that emotional stage is when I was at a point where everything, I started to realize that everything's connected, but I was so in a mindset that it's connected in this dark way, but that every, everything is there as a, some way to control you. And it's the impossible synchronicities, the things where I don't care if, you know, big, living in 1984 and Big Brother's got a microphone in your toilet. There's no way that anyone knows you well enough or knows your deepest, darkest secrets as to why that synchronicity means something to you at that point. You are the only, it's these weird, powerful, impossible synchronicities that when they happen, and very often they would happen to me when I was in a stage of sort of asking, uh, you know, sometimes I would ask a question, almost like a prayer or a question to the universe, you know, just this sort of pleading of like, I don't get it, what's going on? And you say, so what is going on? And then you have this amazingly powerful synchronicity that no one could know about except for you. And if you want to, um, again, if you want to call it God or a universe, or again, some people say this is just a part of yourself. To me, it's a little too solipsistic. I like to balance somewhere between pure solipsism and pure, oh, it's God, oh, it's this. A little somewhere in between those two, two very big extremes. Uh, ultimately, when those things happen, you say, well, okay, if something can speak to me on such a personal level, if I'm connected to the entire universe around me, well, then I know that David Rockefeller doesn't run everything. He doesn't run my personal interactions with my family. He doesn't run my, you know, what happened to me at the laundromat. It doesn't happen that way. So it sounds like, in a way, you took your power back. So it's like... You go from there's no conspiracy to it's all conspiracy and they're all powerful to they're not all powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And I would argue, um, as a, particularly as an artist, it froze me up as an artist because you have these, this is who I actually hold resentment towards. Uh, in the conspiracy realm, the only people that I really still get upset about is the people who are pointing at symbolism and saying this is evidence of some luciferian agenda or some masonic this or masonic and it's not to say that there aren't cases of that i mean yeah there definitely are cases of people put you know plugging their 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 little things in there but to say that as an artist it sort of shuts you down because if you if you know, someone's going to go and demonize every symbolism, every every symbol and every archetype and every every tool in your toolbox, and say that this is somehow evidence of of control or it's part of a mind control or something. I was at a point where it's like, well, if I'm I'm trying to wake people up, right? I, I want to help people. I want to fight the new world order. I want to do all this stuff. Well, I can't use this because that's some mind control thing or that's that's their symbol then you realize no it's not their symbol these are universal symbols so it's also a matter of not just taking back your personal sovereignty which is hugely important not i don't mean to skip your point it's hugely important but as an artist it's also hugely important to reclaim and redefine what a symbol can mean someone wrote here the swastika that's it's a great example you know, swastika is much older than Nazis, right? At some point, Hitler comes along, throws it on his flag, and everyone goes, that's horrible. I, I saw someone on Facebook put up a picture. I was at Ikea, and here's, and it's like all this, like, Eastern Tibetan furniture, and there's a swastika on the wall. And they're like, can you believe Ikea has a swastika on the wall? And there's, like, 35 comments about, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to shop at Ikea again. I can't believe that, you know, they got a swastika on their wall. And I... 
you know, some friend I barely speak to on Facebook, you know, someone you go to high school with and you're like, you're friends with them on Facebook kind of out of obligation. You never really interact with them. We all have those, right? And it's like, I never comment on their stuff. And I'm just like, do I say something? Yeah, okay, I'm going to say something. And I'm like, hey, listen, um, here, I just dropped in some links. Here's what the swastika actually means. This is probably why they're doing that and all this stuff. And then people just kept going and I was like, all right, I mean, if you really want to be upset with someone, why don't, why aren't we upset with like Chase Manhattan Bank, who actually funded the Nazis and their logo is a very thinly veiled swastika. You want to, you know, boycott somebody, boycott Chase Bank. No, no reaction. Okay, I move on with my life. You can't, you know, you, what are you going to do? You can't wake people up. You can't change people's opinions. They're going to get upset about something like that. But as a as an artist, it's important for me, you know, like the, the you know, the eye in the pyramid or you know, any, any triangle, oh, a triangle is somehow Illuminati or a square is Masonic, right? The, the Masons, the Masons, they call themselves, you know, all, being on the square or they're square men. So, I mean, this is basic geometry. If we're going to say that these institutions own these shapes, our basic geometry, well, it's impossible to build anything without those things. So are we just never, never going to use these symbols again? Are we going to let Hitler define the swastika? Are we going to let... And again, I'm not trying to say I want to like... It's not like I want to paint my bedroom and cover in swastikas. I'm just saying we should be able to remember what these things originally meant, what they mean on a universal level. What, let's even think about it. Why did Hitler pick that? Well, he picked it because he thought it was a symbol of power, but he didn't make it up. So he was trying to appropriate that image. It's what anybody's trying to do when a corporation uses a logo... Or they use some sort of idea of whether it's sacred geometry or even an eye in a pyramid. An eye in a pyramid is not evil. It's not inherently evil. It's the eye of providence is a very old symbol. So a company might try and use it thinking that that's going to somehow they can borrow its power. If the United States military, oh, we're going to make a Pentagon. We're going to make our military base with this star on it. And we're going to paint stars on our fighter jets and we're going to put these different symbols on things. This is like, you know, two-bit shamanism trying, maybe if I, maybe if I put this on it, I'll, it'll help me win in a battle. But this is no different than if we went back, you know, 2,000 years and some king paints, you know, this on his shield, hoping that this somehow gives him the power of the eagle. Well, it's basically what America is doing. Oh, let's put an eagle everywhere and we can have that kind of power. Or we'll put a pentagon here. But these things, it doesn't make the symbols evil. It doesn't, you, we shouldn't let them define them. It's someone trying, very often I think trying in vain, to control the archetypes. When ultimately all you could do is understand, you can try and understand them, try and respect them, and maybe try and incorporate them and do your best. But just painting a, a swastika or a star on your thing isn't going to make you win a war any more than, you know, killing a child and dancing around in blood or something. Yes, killing a child and dancing around in their blood, pretty damn evil. Putting a, a star or a, an eye in a pyramid, I just, I just can't see that as evil. I can't see that as, as something to get worried about. If we're going to really criticize a group for using some symbol like that, let's at least do it for the right reasons. Let's, you know, figure out if they've done some sort of misdeed, let's criticize them for their misdeeds, not for their use of symbols. Really good point. Thank you. We're pausing the conversation to allow our guests to tell you about their activities and how you can learn more about them. Alan, tell us about other events in which you were involved and where one can purchase your books. Oh, thank you. My website is syncbookpress.com, or you can go to thesyncbook.com. I should point out that sync, we're spelling S-Y-N-C. A lot of people are either adding or adding an H at the end. It's just S-Y-N-C, so we can do syncbookpress.com or thesyncbook.com. My own website is allthehappycreatures.com. Um, we have done live event. We actually did a live event last January that I was explaining to you guys before, uh, Bill Klaus's, what he calls the Kubrick Transformer. We showed a part of that on a big screen. We had people giving slideshows, different uh, presentations of their information. 
uh, for synchromysticism. And then some people who make, like a gentleman named Kevin Halcott, who makes videos based on exploring different synchromistic threads. Uh, he showed a video. Things like that. My, my wife danced. We had a dance segment. We had a gentleman, Andros Jones, who, who wrote the book uh, Accidental Initiations and who contributed to the first sync book. He does a show called Radio 8 Ball. And we incorporated Andras's format into our live synchromysticism event. And, you know, we talked about what are the applications of synchronicity. Well, there's this idea of spiritual development. There's the idea of perhaps being able to better discern our conspiracy research. But something that probably nearer and dearer to my heart is you can use it to create art with. And a gentleman like Andras and Bill and David Plate. Uh, these guys were you taking synchronicity and making artwork with it. It just really speaks to my heart, and it's just this other area that I just I just want to see more and more of it. I, I love it. We'll now rejoin Alan, Sabal, Chipper, and Susan in their conversation. Hi, Alan. This is Gemini. You stated in an interview a couple of years ago that there's an intelligence that speaks to us through synchronicities. Have you experienced this communication increasing in frequency collectively or personally? And did you notice an increase or shift in the last couple of months that others claim to be experiencing? I don't know. Like this, uh, I was a 2012 agnostic. I think I, I might have told you. I mean, I've discussed this many, many times before. I was actually in 2004 or five. Oh, I don't know. Uh, at some point in mid 2000s, I was asked by a book publisher to write a book saying that the world was going to end in 2012. And they said, you know, hey, listen, we want to we want to do this book. It was a publishing company that said what they would do is they would study whatever trends are, whatever topics are selling, and then they would write a book based on that. They wouldn't, you know, say people pitch books to certain publishers. They wouldn't accept submissions. They were basically did a lot of marketing research. And then once they found a topic that they thought a book topic would sell, they would write a book on that. So they reached out to me and said, would you be willing to write this book? So I, I, you know, obviously I didn't do it, but it's, it's always sort of interesting to me. I could, the, it forever tainted my view of the 2012 phenomenon. This guy saying to me in a New York corporate office, you know, guy probably a little too left-brained, a guy sitting in this office saying to me, very bluntly, we want to scare people into buying books, you know. And so whenever I saw the 2012, any topic coming up with 2012, it just flashed back to being in that office and just saying, this whole thing is a trick. You know, this whole thing is like people getting people worked up over nothing. I know this is not exactly answering your question, but I just would like to at some point address, uh, last time I spoke to you guys was just before the 2012 Olympics, and I remember saying to you then, this is a mind game. You know, they're, they're trying to get people worked up over something, but that it's actually not there. Or, or at least it's not what they're trying to get worked up over. And, of course, the Olympics came and went without anything happening. So the, the 2012 thing, I was sort of saw the doom and gloom around it as this idea of, like, I just don't buy it. It seems like it's just there to instill fear. And then there was the more new agey, like, this is a moment of transition. And on one hand, I, I really saw that as a possibility, but... I think I I had a lot of resentment towards some of the theories that I heard, just as much as I resented the, the doomsday scenarios, was the idea that this was going to be an ascension point for humanity. You know, my thing is like, you don't take 300 million Americans who are sitting on their couch watching football and eating, you know, fast food and Monsanto products and shopping at the, the most horrible corporations and who have you know, doing no spiritual work, no emotional work, no anything on themselves. You don't take 300 million people, let not, let's just talk in America, but we haven't even gotten to the billions of people around the globe, but you think 300 million Americans sitting on their asses watching TV, suddenly, you know, the clock strikes December 21st and you're going to turn into a Buddha, doesn't work that way. You know, you, it's a lot more difficult. It's a lot of hard work. And this is a lot of things you have to struggle with and try and fix your vices and your flaw, your flaws and your faults. So this is sort of how I, I went into the whole 2012 thing. I was just kind of 
but again, projecting outward, um, I'll be the first to admit it. I'm looking, oh, this guy thinks it's going to be Doomsday, and this guy thinks it's going to be the Ascension Point, and oh, you know, it's a lot harder than that, it's a lot harder than that, a lot harder than that. So what I can say is that I am right now in very much in a state of apocalypse. You know, my 2012 Doomsday came, it just came about a week and a half late. Um, <laughs> so... Um, wow, Ex- expound on that a little bit. <laughs> all right, so, I mean, basically I... Um, uh, so I've lived in New York my, my whole life. I, my wife is not from from there originally. She came to live there, and uh, she lived with me for a few years, and then she wanted to live somewhere else. And so I was trying to finish Sync Book 2, and um, this was a sort of put a big financial strain on me getting this book finished, and so we're kind of getting to some like nervousness about money and all this sort of stuff, and then said, okay, well, as soon as this book's finished, we'll figure out what we're going to do. So our lease was up December 15th, and uh, I got the book out very last week of November. So basically I have like three weeks, right, to figure out what I'm doing. Because he was raising our rent, and we knew, okay, we probably don't want to stay in that apartment anymore, but she wants to move out of New York, and what, what should I be doing? Where should we be looking? So I'm in this stage trying to figure out what exactly to do. And I say to my landlord, hey, listen, we're not renewing our lease. We're probably just going to stay here like another month, though. We haven't decided what we're going to do. A friend is actually one of the authors from the, from the Second Sync book. I happened to be talking to him. He said, you should come out to the West Coast to work on this uh, video project with us. And I said, well, I'd like to, but um, my finances, after finishing up the sync book, I just invested a lot of time and money into a project, and I need to put some ground back under my feet. So, you know, I need to just worry about getting some money and, you know, just kind of taking care of a little more practical things at the moment. So he says, well, you you know, you might be able to find work out here and I can speak to my boss and all this stuff. Well, long story short, he says, okay, I spoke to my boss and maybe you could get work out here, but we won't find out till after January 7th. I said, okay, well, let me know when you find out. Come December 20th. So, of course, this is, right, this is almost time wave zero here. December 20th. He calls me up and says, hey, I just heard back from my boss. He says, you know, you you can come out and you can you can uh, come work with us and all this stuff. He's like, but the job would start January seventh. Now this is I'm in New York. This is in Oregon. So hey, there's work for you here if you want to come, but you have to move cross country in the next you know two and a half weeks. My wife gets very excited about the idea. Oh, it'll be beautiful there. Okay. So I'll admit, I was very excited. And okay, hey, this is great. Okay, here's an opportunity. It's a syn- you know, it's a synchronicity. The timing works out. Look, our, our lease is almost, you know, our lease is up, and we're looking to move it anyway. Sure, let's do it. So December twentieth, I said okay. So I had just gotten a job as a as a waiter. Like basically, I finished I finished the the book, and then okay, I need to make some money. Went trying to find some work. I found a job. I worked that job for two days. December 20th comes. He says, no, come move out to Oregon. Okay, quit that job. Tell my landlord I'm moving out. Start packing up my entire apartment, trying to find a place to put things in storage or what do I need, start throwing stuff out. And my landlord comes and shows the apartment. So we're, we're out. You know, we're, we're done. December 30th, late at night, the last, you know, 26 hours of 2012. Mind you, my birthday's... December 31st, so it was like just a few hours before my birthday, get a phone call, hey, about that job. Oh, no. <laughs> you should figure out, maybe you, you shouldn't come, it doesn't look like it's going to work out, and you should see about a plan B. Now, bear in mind, I was planning to start, uh, we were going to drive cross-country, and uh, that would have been January 1st, we wanted to, my wife actually wanted to leave on December 30th or 31st, and I convinced her, let's just wait till after the new year. So we were two days away from getting in a car and leaving. Our apartment's already been shown, have like no money left, all this sort of stuff. And it turns out that whole thing, that option's gone. And basically, hey, you, 
you know, you have to be out of your apartment and where the hell are you going? So I've been dealing with that. It's been an interesting experience. Oh my Uh, gosh. It's just, but it's funny to me because when we ask sometimes about what are, you know, what's the point of synchro mysticism, right? So the thing is, is that I knew on a personal, on a micro personal level, as well as on a macro level, something we were talking about is this idea of descent into darkness. This is kind of how we started the show off, right? Talking about this idea of entering room 237, this idea that you are going to have to deal with some heavy things. And I knew it, like everything was pointing towards that. And I would, I kind of, this is why I always, this is why I've been saying truth in advertising, right? Mm-hmm. I kind of downplayed it because I was like, well, I'm going to have to deal with some really heavy stuff. And I took that as trying to get this book done and, oh man, my finances are tight and my wife's pissed at me and okay, we're going to have to struggle a little bit, we'll make it work. I saw that as my hardship I was going to have to deal with. Without which I sold the experience, sure. It's like, no, it's you're really gonna have to deal with something. This gentleman who who you know made this offer, you know, some everyone's like, oh my god, you must be so mad at him. But I'm actually not, because every synchronicity around this event and every synchronicity that I shared with the gentleman who who basically made this offer and then had to had to rescind the offer, uh, every synchronicity around this gentleman focused around zebras, okay? So it's a kind of sort of obscure thing, focused around zebras. I mean, we would talk about zebras a lot. He, he, he was his favorite animal, and there's zebra, if anyone's like a Philip K. Dick fan, or there's what I, what I was specifically focusing on was this idea of the number 333. If you look up uh, at your leisure, Google what's known as Turanzon. Um, it's this... Some people think of it as like an Aleister Crowley demon. Uh, it's basically, it means like a, it's an experience with a dweller on a threshold. It's sort of your, in, uh, in that sort of language, it's this like last big obstacle before, you know, uh, coming into enlightenment or release or any of these sort of things. I'm not saying, oh, I'm about to be enlightened. I'm saying that's, that's, that's symbolically what it means, right? We had this conversation about how the zebra and the 333 are connected because there was a story where Aleister Crowley said he turned this demon, this, this demon churn zone, he, he was able to turn it into a zebra and sell it to a zoo. So we, I'm kind of like constantly laughing to myself knowing that I'm encountering my dweller on the threshold. I'm stepping into this moment where I'm going to have to deal with all these things. Now, so one is I'm mad at myself, if anybody, for selling the experience short. And number two, I can't be mad at this guy because understanding how archetypes work, I understand that he is simply playing out his, so he's simply playing out that archetype that I knew I was going to be encountering. And here's this man that it's zebra, 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 zebra. Oh, turn zone. Ha, 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 ha. I knew I had to know on one level what's coming. Now, I don't have a personal resentment to him. Like, I think otherwise, if I was less aware of what's happening, I could project my, my frustration onto him, right? And say, like, you asshole, how could you do this to me? I could be really just projected outwards. But understanding the archetypes around it, I understand, no, okay, this is what I knew was coming. And this is just, here's a human being that's playing out that archetype for me right now in this point in my life that doesn't you know on a very practical level means okay you know i don't ask this guy to like babysit my children for a month i know he's not maybe that reliable (laughs) you know there's still the uh the the left brain still comes in and says all right you know your lesson learned there but i'm not mad at the guy because this is he's just playing out the archetype at the point in my life when i knew i was going to have this confrontation with this archetype and he's just playing it out. It's not like he's a bad guy. It's not like he's possessed by a demon. Or I don't, you know, I don't even believe in demons. I'm just saying, like, this is an archetype, and I'm just interacting with it. But I knew I was going to be. Paul Levy, who uh, is in Sync Book 2, he, he writes about how archetypes... And I know you guys just had on Jonathan Zapp, who, yes. uh, if, if anyone's interested in learning more about archetypes, I think he did... I listened to your show with him. He did a really good job of exploring these concepts. 
So if we could just say archetypes, if people don't know what that is, that was a really good interview. Dig that. So this idea is Paul Weavey takes this idea of that entire nations can play out an archetype. People can play out archetypes. You know, these are things where there's a time and a place where this archetype is going to seek expression or that's just the natural order of things. You know, we understand this archetype follows this. This is a sort of monomyth or, right, the grand narrative. If we're able to see it in everything, then we kind of know what's coming next. So we know this archetype is going to be expressing itself, particularly on, my, on a personal level. I knew I was going to be encountering it. I can't be mad at the person enacting it. So if anything, when we say, what is a practical use of this stuff? I think it's incredibly helpful because now I'm not worried about the same way that in the conspiracy realm, I'm not so upset about the control system doing this thing. I understand that even that control system, and again, on a practical level, that's no excuse for their misdeeds. But these are nations or corporations that are playing out something that we all have to deal with. They're playing out the devil. They're playing out the, you know, our challenges, our obstacles. And to a certain extent, we need to encounter these things in order to grow and to develop. It's not an excuse for them. Again, on a practical level, you should be aware of them and know how to deal with them. I'm just saying someone's going to do it. Yes, someone's going to play out the archetype. Don't necessarily demonize the person. And you should also don't demonize the archetype. You know, there's nothing wrong with a devil archetype. There's nothing wrong with a, uh, again, just like with a symbol. Symbols are, you know, they don't have a morality to them. They're not, you know, consciously messing with you. They just are what they are. Someone's going to play it out. And if you understand it, then you can better, you know, handle that experience. That makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate you explaining that. And we'd like to have you back in a couple of weeks and we can continue this fascinating conversation about archetypes and myths. And um, it's been a wonderful uh, conversation with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'd be happy to join you. This concludes our initial symposia with Alan Abbott Desa Green. Stay tuned for our continuing conversation. <laughs> <laughs>